Evening, everybody. Welcome to the Chris Salcedo Show Worldwide. Happy you have tuned into the program this evening. Uh, of course, coming up, uh, it is Monday after all, our weekly visit with Mary Ramirez will be coming up and see if she can stump me this week on the Spanish phrase. I mean, by the way, how many of you got last week's phrase? I'm, I'm just, well, many of you are probably multilingual and actually got it. Uh, for those of you who don't know, Mary and I play this little game. Uh, she, uh, of course, is, uh, is Ramirez by marriage. And she is more fluent in Spanish than I am. So the game is she will say a common American phrase in Spanish, literally literally translated. And your liberty-loving Latino here tries to guess it. And um, <laughs> last week, the first, the first uh, shot at this little game of ours, uh, I didn't fare so well. So anyway, that's coming up in the second hour. Hope you guys can stick around for that. Meantime, let's get you guys caught up on uh, how to get in touch with the show. ChrisSalcedo.com, C-H-R-I-S-S-A-L-C-E-D-O.com. Uh, there you can find, it's a kind of a one-stop resource. You can drop me an email. You can even call and leave a voicemail. If you guys do call and leave voicemails, I will be able to play some of those here on the air if you guys have questions or you want something to me to, for me to address. So again, ChrisSalcedo.com, you guys can call the number there and leave a message if you want something here addressed. Uh, Twitter, at ChrisSalcedoTX, at C H R I S. S-A-L-C-E-D-O-T-X, as in Texas. All right, so those are the social media outlets. By the way, we're on Facebook as well, The Chris Salcedo Show. Uh, let's go ahead and start with the first element tonight. And um, I've got to tell you that this is something that's been on my radar screen for a while. This is the, the Obamacare subsidies were stopped uh, by the Trump administration. For those of you who don't know what these subsidies are, were, Barack Obama in, uh, inside of the Democrats Obamacare law they instituted a a fund or a requirement for funding to pay off the traitorous insurance companies with taxpayers money so they would lower the cost uh the ballooning costs under Obamacare of health insurance well uh those payments were not authorized by Congress they were called for in the law but Congress just didn't fund them so what Obama did in retaliation, he said, let me be clear, I'm just going to order them anyway. So Barack Obama, as the chief executive, he ordered that these payments be made out of the Treasury. Now, for those of you who don't know your Constitution very well, like Barack Obama and the Democrats, that is a power that is only reserved for the Congress of the United States. Appropriations are reserved to the president of the United States. Uh, this guy here over my right shoulder is Jonathan Turley. He is a liberal. He is a law professor, a constitutional law professor, uh, much better than Barack Obama, too, uh, at that. He was asked about these payments. And because I think he was the one who led the lawsuit to stop these unconstitutional payments, again, because the president doesn't have the power or the authority to tell the Treasury to release any money that is exclusively reserved for your and my so-called representatives. So this is what Jonathan Turley jumped on Fox News with Brett Baer, and this is what he had to say. The original order that has just been rescinded was unconstitutional by finding of a federal court. The court found it not only violated Article I of the Constitution, it violated the health care law itself because Congress had the ability to grant subsidies under the federal law, but it chosen not to. In fact, the administration had come to Congress and asked for this money, and Congress said no. Yep. And that's the way it, our checks and balances system works. Barack Obama was the least constitutionally adherent uh, occupier of the Oval Office that I had ever seen. And again, what he did was basically say, well, I need this money. And if you're not going to give me the money, I'm just going to take it. That's what third world dictators do. That's what banana republics do. So Jonathan Turley being a devotee not to liberalism or to Democrats. He was a devotee to the Constitution, our framework that has built our great country. He ha helped other states file a lawsuit. These payments are illegal. Even under the Obamacare law, they're illegal. So Trump says, well, I'm going to side with the Constitution and side with the law. And that's where this whole conversation came from. And then the president said, all right, I'll just order it directly from the Treasury. 
Well, you can't do that. I mean, the defining power of Congress is the power of the purse. And the federal judge issued an historic ruling and said, this is wrong. You can't violate the Constitution, no matter what your motivations are, no matter what you're complaining about with Congress. You have to play within the rules of the Constitution. Yeah, and that's Barack Obama's big thing was, let me be clear, Congress isn't doing what I want them to do, so I get to do what I want. That's not the way our Constitution works. Barack Obama knew it. And the president he was referring to there was resident Obama. All right. Uh, Mr. Turley went on to have a conversation about a reaction to this guy. Uh, this is Javier Bacera. He used to be a, uh, a member of Congress. He's now the attorney general for the once great state of California. He is a loudmouth leftist Latino. And here's what he had to say about President Trump's following the Constitution. The Trump administration is deciding not to follow the law. You, everyone has to follow the law. Every one of us has to pay our bills. Uh, just because Donald Trump is president doesn't mean he doesn't have to follow the law. We did not mean to have an executive decide which of the subsidies for Americans that would be paid and which wouldn't. Donald Trump is deciding which ones he wants to pay and which ones he doesn't. He doesn't get to do that just because he's president. Well, that's not what President Trump did. President Trump recognized that it was Congress's job to fund these subsidies. And Congress didn't do it. Now, of course, Javier Becerra can jump on MSNBC and get away with such nonsense, trying to say that following the law is actually violating the law. Congress, its sole purpose is to put out funding, is to, is to, to appropriate money. Our representatives. Now, Javier Becerra knows this. He's just hoping that the audience on this channel is so stupid that they won't uh, that they won't realize that he's lying through his teeth, which is the M.O. of the Democrat these days, isn't it? The, the modus operandi of the Democrat is to tell lies to the American people. I mean, Barack Obama did that through his entire occupation of the Oval Office. He he looked at it, his idea to lie to the American people like your doctor, keep your doctor, like your plan, keep your plan. Uh, you'll save $2,500 a year as an average family of four. All a pack of lies. Um, Al-Qaeda is on the run and path and, and uh, on the path to defeat. ISIS is a JV team. This is what Democrats do, folks. This is what liberal extremists do. Just like Cuba's Castro. He lies to their people that the source of their woes is America. Just like... Uh, the people in Iran, the Ayatollah in Iran, he lies to his people saying, oh, it's everybody else's problem. It's not me exploiting you. This is what Democrats do in this country. They lie to the American people. And because of places like MSNBC, they get away with those lies because those individuals who are on MSNBC and, and other media outlets, they are Democrats first, liberals first and journalists second, sometimes even third. Uh, Jonathan Turley responded to the loudmouth leftist Latino, Javier Becerra, and that's what he said. Well, it's rather bizarre because he's talking about a law that was, I, I'm sorry, an order that was found to be unconstitutional. So what President Trump just did is say we're not going to continue to pay subsidies that a federal court said was unconstitutional. And so what this does is returns the issue to where it should have remained all along, which is in Congress. You know, we don't have a lot of options in a democratic process. You can compromise and convince people in Congress, or you could try to change Congress, but you can't circumvent Congress. Congress. You can't just order the Treasury to release billions of dollars without an appropriation of Congress. So what are these attorneys general like Becerra, and the map includes 18 states and the District of Columbia, what are they, you know, how, what grounds are they using to sue the administration over this decision to stop subsidies? I, before, before Jonathan Turley answers, let me take a crack at it. I think what these Democrats are doing is usually utilizing the court system to drag and stretch everything out in the hopes that they can drag and stretch everything out until Donald Trump is back on, back out of, or is out of office, maybe not elected in three years. Or if he is, then they're in big trouble. They're in, in huge, big trouble. They're trying to drag it out, hoping or thinking that the American people won't reelect him so that they can get a, a Democrat back into the Oval Office so the lawlessness can continue. So the ignoring of the Constitution can continue. Uh, it's only it's only uh, a breaking of the Constitution, a breaking of law if somebody challenges you. Right. And throughout the entire eight years of Barack Obama, how many times did Republicans actually, uh, you know, challenge Barack Obama? The Democrats want to get back to there. 
because the current Republican Party, they're not in the mood to stand up for the Constitution. They're not in the mood to stand up for your rights and the restrictions the Constitution places on government. And the Democrats are banking on that. They want these milk toast Republicans to lay down to get another Democrat in there so they can run roughshod over your rights and the limits the Constitution places on government. I think Turley has a, a different take on this. I think they're going to try to relitigate what we litigated earlier in the Price case. Which you and welcome. Which, we, we, uh, frankly, I would welcome because I think it'll amplify the victory we had before. But unfortunately, this is a sort of perpetual litigation machine that we've seen where every, t every move ends up in court. There's this cathartic reaction to go to court. You know what? And yeah, cathartic. Yeah, it makes people feel better. Democrats can raise money saying, oh, we're fighting Trump. We're fighting Trump. It won't go anywhere. Plus, it costs the American taxpayers billions upon billions of dollars to adjudicate every drop and tittle of somebody's agenda. Barack Obama. Hey, you all remember Barack Obama shoved his agenda down our throat with nearly. Well, the states fought him. The, the conservative states fought him. But the Republicans in Congress. Yeah, uh, not so much. All right. Another thing that happened uh, last week was something kind of extraordinary. Uh, that is General Kelly, the chief of staff to the president of the United States. And Mr. Kelly, along with so many, so many other administration officials, have been under an, uh, an unrelenting bashing by the press. Story after story after story has been released about how this guy is against President Trump, how Tillerson's called him a moron, which I, I actually I kind of believe. But the press is eager to drive these wedges in between Republicans or the, or the president's inner circle as a mechanism of dividing the administration. This would never happen under Barack Obama, never happen under a Clinton administration. The press views its job is to make life as hard as humanly possible on Republicans. Or those with whom they politically disagree. Because you, you can't even call Donald Trump a traditional Republican. He fights too much. He, he says something and then actually thinks he might want to deliver on those promises. That is the least Republican thing you can do these days. Anyway, uh, I digress. Here's General Kelly uh, surprising the press corps, jumping out there and saying, um, well, uh, I, have, I have some news for you guys. Now, remember... I, I got to tell you that the the reporting coming up to this is he was unhappy. He couldn't rein in the president in his tweets. Uh, he was one foot out the door. Uh, the president was unhappy with him, and the president was going to kick him out the door. This is that this is what passes for reporting in the United States of America these days among so-called journalists. They're not journalists anymore. They're Democrat Party operatives. So they they will get a source which has been proven wrong over and over and over again and it's never the point the point is and as a matter of fact general kelly said that i'd encourage you all to find better sources because the sources that are being utilized inside of the basket of bias press well they're wrong a lot but that's not the point the point is is to have somebody say it and, and, and trust me folks this is the level of introspection that goes on inside these these newsrooms oh would you just say it so I can print it? Would you just say it so I can report it? I know it's not true, but I can report it. And thus it can undermine the Trump administration. Thus it can undermine a confidence. And then we can mire this president down in, in so much bad reporting that he won't be able to move his agenda forward. And, and trust me, in, in many of these newsrooms, that is the MO. Uh, here's uh, General Kelly, the chief of staff to the president of the United States. I'm not quitting today. Uh, I, I don't believe, and I just talked to the president, I don't think I'm being fired today. This is really, really hard work. Yeah, well, I, I can imagine. It's hard enough work, you know, doing what you need to do every day to help the president run the country. I can imagine having an entire basket of bias press arrayed against you every single day and making that much harder. He had the reason why he had to take time out of his duties was to step up here and address a press that had been reporting irresponsibly. Did you guys hear the the laughter in the background when he got up there and he said, yeah, you know what? I'm not being fired today. I'm not quitting today. And there was a big, big chuckle there inside of the press room. It's so it's so much fun when we like, you know, use these faulty sources and we report uh, bias news or untrue news just to make your life miserable. Isn't that funny? Glad you got the joke, Chief of Staff Kelly. 
well, the joke was lost on Molly Hemingway. She's with the Federalist. She jumps on Fox News. And Molly actually had a reaction similar to what I had, I coming from the news ranks originally before I got into opinion and talk. It was actually very frustrating for me when he said that he wasn't quitting today and the room erupted in laughter as if it were really funny that they go and they write all these stories every few days about how he's quitting and how they have all the best sources that he's quitting. And when he denies it, they act like it's really funny. It's not funny to have so many stories based on unreliable anonymous sources and the public can't check these sources. I mean, I saw that earlier in the show that you had uh, someone from a different outlet saying, no, really, trust us. Our sources are good. Well, uh, she's talking about Lester Holt from NBC News, who jumped up there and said, well, our sources uh, say they were in the meeting. Of course, all of the other named sources, named sources like uh, uh, Rex Tillerson and uh, uh, General Kelly there and uh, General Mattis, they said all of these reports about, and this, this all goes back to this report about Donald Trump saying that he wanted to increase our nuclear arsenal tenfold. And, of course, everybody that was present in the meeting said, that never happened. Uh, but they get to report it because somebody, a source, and all of these sources have been proven wrong time and time and time again. But they keep using them. Why? Because truth isn't the objective from NBC, ABC, and CBS. By the way, if truth were the objective at NBC, wouldn't they have reported on Harvey Weinstein? They never did. At least when the, the story first broke. There's no way to trust when they contradict information that's on the record. And there's no way to check and hold them accountable. And I think it's really a huge threat in addition to the external threats to freedom of the press. There's the internal threat of how the media are handling their jobs and how they're losing their standards and how they're breaking that social contract. They get a lot of perks and privileges as part of this First Amendment agreement. And they are not living up to those standards. I'm glad she said it because I have felt this for so many years. The First Amendment of the U.S. Constitution is a sacred charge. The First Amendment of the Constitution, the freedom of the press, our founding fathers viewed a press that was fair and aggressive as essential to holding power accountable. And the press goes to sleep whenever there's a Democrat in the Oval Office. They don't hold Democrats accountable. And they, in this, in this particular Republican's case, they're patently unfair to the Republican Party. I mean, you thought it was bad in the past. I mean, John McCain, Mitt Romney, they all got up close and personal, uh, shall we say, lessons in the bias of the press. But I have never seen anything like this. And the press, in their hysteria over Donald Trump, has abandoned their First Amendment charge. And they are disgusting for doing so. Uh, we're going to, I just wanted to get you up to speed on some of these issues, ladies and gentlemen, coming up next, the one, the only Mary Ramirez. Hopefully you can stick around the Chris Salcedo show worldwide here on the Vita television network. Welcome back, everybody, to the Chris Salcedo Show Worldwide. Glad you have joined us um, over my right shoulder. It's uh, the one, the only Mary Ramirez, and she's uh, she's in the car, folks. Uh, th th this is, this is going to be a first for me. I don't think I've ever conducted an interview in a moving car. But it, 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 it is, yeah, hey, look, you get firsts on the Chris Salcedo Show Worldwide. Uh, conservative Latino? I, I mean, come on. When was the last time you saw that on TV? Now you're going to see a, a live live interview. <laughs> On, on the road. How you doing, Mary? Doing great. Yeah, I think this is a first for me, too. I don't know that we've even ever done radio live in the car. So this is no, you know fun. what? No, this, this, this is a first. Not even on the Chris Salcedo show on radio have we done this. So uh, for those of you who were with us last week, uh, oh, you know what? I'm hoping you brought your notes because there was a phrase last week 
that Dead. you you okay good because you, you you let's start off because folks in case you're just joining Mary speaks better Spanish than I do as a matter of fact as a matter of fact she's fluent I well I'm not um so um Mary <laughs> she's going to challenge me every week with a phrase a common American phrase but literally translated right. into Spanish and I'm going to try to guess it so Mary tell tell the folks project if you will what what last week's phrase was all right, so last week's phrase was un centavo ahorrado es un centavo ganado. One more time. Un centavo ahorrado es un centavo ganado. And I had no idea what that was. So go ahead. What, no, what, is, no. what does it translate into well, into English? You were, you were close because you got something with a penny. It's a penny saved. It's a penny earned. Ah, okay. <laughs> See? Now, what, 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 what did I say? In for a penny, in for a pound, right? That's what I said. I think you did. So yeah. you, you were on the right track with, with the coinage, but yeah. <laughs> gotcha. All right. All right. So let's, uh, let's get into, uh, before we get to next week's phrase that I'm going to try to guess, let's talk about what you wrote about this week on your, on your blog. Well, as you know, the Trump administration began the rollback of the Obamacare, or rather the Obama administration's contraception mandate. Um, which, of course, required employers to pay for birth control, regardless of their moral or religious leanings. Um, and of course, the problem with that was, you know, you're, you're forcing someone to, to pay with their money for something that they don't believe in. So that, that was rolled back. And I, watching the reaction, of course, was funny. It was expected. But I saw this article, and I, I think it was over at Slate, if I'm recalling correctly. Um, and, and they talked about how this now means that, that, that the fate of your reproductive health care is now in the hands of your male religious employers. <laughs> okay. And uh, I thought that, that, oh, I, I know. I heard something similar to that with Hillary Clinton saying that, uh, that now because of, of your employer's religious e e e uh, exceptions, your women's health is now in the hands of, uh, of your employers. Which, wait a minute, isn't that exactly what Obamacare did? It forced employers to put women's health in their hands by forcing them to pay for it, right? It, well, that's exactly right. Yeah, in my <laughs> mind, this gets, this gets government and your employer out of your bedroom. That's how I look at it. Well, right. Isn't that always the point? Isn't it always get out of my health care, get out of my, and, you know, insert body part here. You know, <laughs> that's, I mean, that's, that's, that is what they always say, right? Yet here it is when it comes to who pays for it. You know, then they want the government involved. And, and I have to say, as a woman, and as I'm watching these so-called feminists pitch this, this royal hissy fit over this, how exactly is it feminist to demand that, you know, that your male employers, if they're male, assuming, uh, pay for something that you want to use by virtue of a choice? How is it feminist to expect someone else to do that for you? Shouldn't you be capable of providing Well, for you know, health? you know, Mary, we live in an era where Harvey Weinstein... Uh, because he donated all of his powerful money, he was able to exploit women at will, and they didn't report his what, what some are alleging now is felonious activities. Uh, right. So, so I mean, liberal women will subjugate themselves uh, to uh, in, in service to liberalism, uh, so long as they, you know they're, they're paying for the right things, right? whether it's contraception, whether it's uh, for uh, Harvey Weinstein, big abortion uh, funder. So. Yeah, that, that, that's uh, – didn't you know that in certain cases uh, you can check your feminist card at the door? Apparently. Apparently yep. so. I mean, as long as you're saying the right things, like you said, donating to the right people, giving the right money to the right causes, then you can say whatever you want, do whatever you want. But, but yeah, it's just absolutely incredible. And, it, and again, you know, what, what do the feminists always tell us? That it's, it's my body, it's my choice, right? Okay, <laughs> well, now – it, what you're trying to prevent, that is a pregnancy, right? That is the result of what? A choice. A choice. That you're making. No one's tying you down to a table like the handmaid's tail and forcing you <laughs> to do something. This is a choice that you're making. And if you can't afford that pregnancy or don't want that pregnancy, then you have a choice. Well, what Even they're saying, what they're passion. saying too, Mary, is they're saying, it's my body, my choice, but your wallet. That's what they're saying. Well, who did I see? You know, I think it was, it was Matt Walsh, maybe, over at The Blaze, yeah. that, that tweeted out something like that. Basically, you know, get out of my sex life, get out of my bedroom, leave your wallet on the on the table on the way out. <laughs> That's it's great. It's exactly what it is. The double standard is absolutely epic. Uh, glad you are, are with us, folks. This is uh, Mary Ramirez, longtime contributor to the Chris Salcedo Show on radio, and now she is 
uh, with us on the Chris Salcedo Show worldwide. And yes, she is in the car. That that right there is the leading edge of a car seat. That's where her little girl is is slumbering right now. As we are speaking, uh, Hillary Clinton came out and she said and she she rattled off all of these stats talking about how contraception uh, whittled down unwanted pregnancy and all of this kind of stuff at an all time low abortions were at an all time low. And she, she rattled all of this off and she even admitted in the same soundbite that all of this work was done before Obamacare before, (laughs) before Obama mandated that, that employers pay for your sex life. Basically Uh, she admitted that all of this stuff in the Obamacare legislation had nothing to do with the decrease of of right. unwanted pregnancies or or right. sexually transmitted diseases, all this kind of stuff. I mean, these people don't even hear themselves talking. No, because it's it's the Trump administration. Therefore, you know, again, I mentioned the Handmaid's Tale a few minutes ago. We're living in some sort of Handmaid's Tale world. I'm not sure if okay. you're familiar right. with that. Okay, all right, hold on. You got it. You got to. Not everybody here is going to have watched that series, so you're going to have to explain well, to them what the handmaids. By the way, you got my wife hooked on that, so she's watching that thing now. I meant I, I refuse. I I wouldn't watch it, but now go ahead, tell the folks what Handmaid Tale is. Well, you know, and actually, to be full disclosure, I'm not a fan. I don't watch it myself, but it's it's this this world, this world imagined as sort of a, a cult. What is it? It's it's where women are subjugated to men, and they're required to live in this cult. They're required to sleep with the various religious leaders their every move is mandated by men and the funny thing about the show it's really quite awful quite graphic um but uh the interesting thing is i've seen various articles talking about the relevancy of the handmaid's tale in the trump administration era or the era of the trump administration as if that's what we women are subjugated to under donald trump and to your point all of these things that Hillary Clinton was listing off happened before Obamacare. But yet suddenly when, when Donald Trump decides to roll back a portion of that, oh, now suddenly we're living in the handmaid's tale. Yeah. Harvey Weinstein, yeah. Anthony Weiner, Bill Clinton. Uh, we can go down the whole laundry list. We can call it hands made tale or we can call it the Democrat Party. Either way, that, that that's the real home of, of all of this misogyny and all of this exploitation of women. Uh, so what is the name of your piece this week? So it is serious question. When did birth control become reproductive health care? Yeah. And that is going to be up on my blog, futurefree.com, and I'll tweet a link out after this segment. Very good. You know what? I got to say that when uh, the, the, that individuals who classify abortion as health care, I mean, they really are idiots because abortion is, is the taking of life. It is the, the ending exact of life. opposite of, of right. health care. OK, uh, yeah. do, do you have this week's phrase ready to go? I do. I do have it ready to go. Are you ready? You have to be very. You have to project so it's very, very clear because you know. I. Right. I, I, I yeah. Go ahead. <laughs> All right. Here we go. So it is. Un pájaro en la mano vale dos en el arbusto. <sighs> okay. Well, okay, one more time. Go ahead. All right. We'll do it very slow. All right. Okay. Un pájaro en la mano vale dos en el arbusto. A bird in the hand is worth two in the bush. Bingo. You got hey, it. Hey, how about that? <laughs> Your liberty-loving Latino without a command of the Spanish language actually can get probably every other word. Mary Ramirez, everybody, a longtime contributor to the Chris Salcedo Show and now part of the Chris Salcedo Show worldwide. Thank you for making time on a, a little family excursion you got going on there uh, for us live. Well, by the way, what, what part of the country are you in right now? We just, we're in Northwest Indiana, but just got through South Chicago. Rahm Emanuel's paradise, liberal paradise. <laughs> <laughs> Make sure you have your, your Kevlar vests on, and uh, we'll see you next week, okay? Sounds like a plan. Thanks, Chris. That's going to do it, everybody, for the Chris Salcedo Show Worldwide. Check us out on social media, at Chris Salcedo TX on Twitter, and at ChrisSalcedo.com. See you tomorrow night.